Rupamurri Maturim Gostuatim Radha Kunda Magivaram Oh Radhika Bhavasam Prabhu Yasya Pratita Kripaya Sri Guru Tam Natosmi Kurave Gaura Chandraya Radhikaya Tadale Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tad Bhaktaya Namo Nama Ananda Lila Maya Vigrahaya he ma bade bhyat chavi sundaraya Tas mai maha prema rasa pradaya Chaitanya chandraya namo namaste Chaitanya chandraya namo namaste Chaitanya chandraya namo namaste Sham sundar shikanda shikar Svaraha Samurai Manora Radhika Rasikamama Kripa Nidhe Sapriya Charna King Kurim Kuru Tavaivasmi Tavaivasmi Najivami Toyabina Iti Vikaya Devi Tam Nayama Chana Hantikam First of all, I offer my sister Dandabhat Puspanjali my heart like flowers thousands and thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual Gurudev, Asmadiya Paramaraja Tamaguru Padapadma, Nitilila Paravishta Om Vishnu Pad. Ashtotara Sata Sri Rupa Nuga Charivarya Sila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my uh, Guru's Guru to Srila Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupa Nuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the assembled Devotees around the world, Vancha Kalpa Turubascha Kripa Sindhubhyavacha Putitanam Bhavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Nama By the causes mercy of Sri Guru and Gauranga, we have been hearing from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 9, and now we have come to the final verse, that is text 34. You may remember that in the previous verse, Sri Krishna said, Anityam asukam lokam imam prapya vajasvamam. Hey Arjun, knowing that you have come into this imperman impermanent, this temporary world, which is asuk full of distress, full of difficulties. What should you do? Bajashvamam. You should engage in my bhajan. Engage in my loving devotional service. This is the perfection uh, of life for every living being. So, although in previous verses, Sri Krishna has described the Nishkarm Karma Yoga, how to offer the fruits of one's work to Sri Krishna, having no attachment for the fruit of one's work, and also practicing bhakti at the same time. Even Pradani Bhuta Bhakti, that is mainly practicing bhakti, but also doing one's duties and offering the fruit. Uh, but uh, this can be called Pradani Bhuti Bhakti, that is uh, the performance of 
our worldly activities were predominated by devotion, but that is not called Ananya Bhakti, one-pointed, unmixed devotion. So now in the final verse of this chapter entitled Raja Guya, Guya Yoga, the yoga of the king of knowledge, see Krishna is giving that very king of knowledge, that is the how to do bhajan, to serve Krishna in Ananya Bhakti, not mixed with any other type of supporting sadhana. So here in verse 34, he's saying, Manmana bhavamad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskuru mam evaisasi yuktvaivam atmanam matparayanaha here we have manmana bhava absorb your mind fully in me bhava madhabakto become my devotee madhyaji mam worship me namaskuru offer your obeisances to me mam evaisasi Yuktvayavam Atmanam. Here Atmanam refers to the body, the mind, the pran, the senses, determination, the intelligence. All of these things are synonyms for the word uh, Atma. So because Sri Krishna has described Manmana, absorb your mind in me, but also Madhyajiman. Do activities with your body, such as worship, namaskaru, bowing down. So therefore, we should take the word atmanam to uh, refer to all of its various uh, synonyms here. It means being matparayana, dedicated to me, atmanam, by body, mind, intelligence, pran, senses, determination, everything. And if you'll do that, then mam that means Sri Krishna is saying, you will come to me. Mm -hmm. Sri Krishna wants to impart here that pure bhakti is like the Ganga. Just as the Ganges never considers anyone's qualification whether they are pure or whether, whether they are sinful. So in the same way, if someone comes in contact with the flow of bhakti, then bhakti, not considering whether they are pure or sinful, anyway, purifies everyone without discrimination. Now, by this verse, see Krishna is explaining that for the pure soul, they have no other duty, only to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They have no relationship with the Supreme Truth in the form of Brahman, in personal Brahman. They have no relationship with God as Ishwara, the, the form of Paramatma in the heart. They are related only to Bhagavan. And even Sri Krishna is saying here, don't uh, worship the other forms of myself. Hmm? such as uh, Narayan or Nishingadev, Barahadev, Kurama, Matsya and others. See, Krishna said, Manmana, be, absorb your mind in me, Shama Sundar, with a beautiful dark complexion like a bluish lotus flower, with the charming eyes that glance, full of compassion, with a sm sweet smile and soft curling hair falling up over my face. Krishna said, me, be devoted to me. This is his highest secret instruction. So, this verse appears here at the end of chapter 9, and it's also repeated again with a slight uh, variation in, uh, towards the end of chapter 18 in verse 1865. So you can see the last line, the last two lines here 
Amam evaisyasi yuk dvayvam atmanam atparayana and in the uh, 1865, there see Krishna said, Man mana bhava same. Then he says, Mam evaisyasi, same. Then, Satyam te pratijani priyosime. Which means, Satyam means I'm making a vow. That, Mam evaisyasi, Satyam, I'm making a vow that you will come to me. Why? Pratijani Priyosime, I promise this because you are very dear to me. You are most beloved to me. So, now a question comes. See, Krishna is saying practically, practically the same verse two times. What is the difference? So, Here, in chapter 9, Krishna is instructing Arjun, who is a Parinishtita devotee, Parinishtita. And the same verse is used, uh, with a slight variation in chapter 18, to refer to the Nirapeksha devotee. So this requires some um, explanation. And this will help us to have a very fine and nuanced understanding of See Krishna's instructions and the difference between the Nishkarm Karma uh, Yoga, which is um, in the, um, connected to pure bhakti in the form of Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti. What's the difference between this and Ananya Bhakti? A, a devotee just yesterday from Russia was asking this question. So we'd like to go into this a little bit more detail today. So, Srila Baladevi Debushan, to help us understand uh, the, and bring the flow of the teachings of the Gita into harmony, he has explained that there are three types of devotees. The first one is called the Sanishta or Swanishta. In script you can find both versions, Swanishta, Sadaka and Sanishta Sadaka. So the first one, the Sanista Sadak, then the second one is called Parinishtita Sadak, and then the last one is called Nirapeksha. So these uh, three types of practitioners you'll also find described in the um, third chapter of Vedanta Sutra. Now, what is their speciality? So first of all, the Sanista Bhakta is the devotee who follows the gradual process of doing nishkarm, karma yoga, performing his worldly duties without attachment to the fruits, offering them to the Supreme Lord, and also practicing bhakti at the same time. If a person is practicing more nishkarm, karma yoga than bhakti, then that is called guni bhuta bhakti. And if the emphasis is on the bhakti, he's doing more bhakti than the Nishkarm Karma Yoga, then that is called Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti. And that um, Bhagavad Arpita uh, Nishkarm Karma Yoga Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti was described by Sri Krishna earlier in this chapter when he said, Yadkaroshi, uh, Yadasnasi, Yadjoosi, Dadasi, Yad. Whatever you do, whatever you offer, and whatever you give to me, whatever austerities you perform, you do that as an offering unto me. Mm. So, uh, this devotee, he is going through the Sanista, Sanistita devo, Sanista devotee, he's going through the stages of Nishkam Karma Yoga. From this he develops Gyan and uh, he practices some uh, Dhyana Yoga as well. So he goes through the stages described in Bhagavad Gita and finally he comes to Bhakti Yoga. So this is the Sanishta devotee. Now we come to the Parinishtita Bhakta. The Parinishtita Bhakta, he has hearing and chanting as his main sadhana. 
he also performs some of the rules of Varnashram Dharma, but without any attachment. To set an example for persons who are less advanced, and for Loka Sangraha, that's to, that means to keep society together. Hmm? So that those who, um, who don't have faith in Bhakti, but then if they would, would see him also neglecting Varnashram Dharma, they may ne neglect the Varnashram Dharma, and while not having faith in Bhakti, and they'll be lost and ruined. So the Parinishtita devotee, he's mainly doing Bhakti, but he's doing some karmas, some worldly duties, but he's not doing that to as a, a means of purification for himself. But rather, he's just doing it to set an example for others who don't have faith, that is for Loka Sangraha. So, then, the Nirapeksha devotee, he is, does not do any mm, Varnashram Dharma duties at all. So he is completely renounced from all worldly activities. So, of these three types of devotees, the Sanishta devotee and the Parinishtita devotee, they are uh, generally uh, householders. They are Grihastas. And the Nirapeksha devotees, they are in the renounced order of life. Now, what about the Ananya Bhakta? The Ananya Bhakta only does pure devotion. So for a person who is near Apeksha, who has renounced all worldly duties, he's only doing devotion, then we can say that it's very uh, easy for the near Apeksha devotee to be classified as Ananya Bhakta, doing undivided devotional service. Now, does that mean that those who are Grihastas, that they cannot be called Ananya Bhaktas, that they can only be called um, Bhagavad Arpita, Nishkam, um, Karma Yoga, uh, the Pradani, the Karma Yoga Mishra, Pradani Bhuta Bhakti, that they can never be called Ananya Bhaktas? So, the answer is this. No. Those who are uh, the Sanishta Bhaktas, when they are doing their duties, even though they may be Pradani Bhuta, mainly doing Bhakti, but they're also doing their worldly duties, in their mind they have the idea, I am doing these duties to, as a means of purification, to support my Bhakti. And therefore their Bhakti is considered to be Mishra, it is mixed, and Pradani Bhuta. But the Parinishtita devotee, if he is performing, of course he's performing mainly bhakti, but if he's doing some worldly duty, he's not thinking, I am doing this worldly duty actually as a part of my sadhan to purify myself to support my bhakti. Hmm? But rather, he's focused completely on remembering Krishna, hearing and chanting, and he has to do some duties for his bodily maintenance, etc. And when he's doing these duties, he's not thinking, oh, I'm offering the results of this to Krishna, so these duties will be purifying to me. He's rather remembering Krishna as deeply as possible, and when he's doing the duties, he's just thinking, oh, this is not uh, important for my life, I am just doing this to set an example for others. So, this is what makes the difference between the Ananya Bhakti. It is not whether the person is uh, in the renounced order or in the household life. It is not the diff whether the person is doing Bhakti mainly and but he has to do some karma to maintain himself or he doesn't do any karma at all. This is not the thing that decides. What decides is if a person having faith in the purificatory power of Nishkarma Karma Yoga, when he's practicing, he's doing his karma, and he's doing this with the intention, I will get some extra purification by this, then he becomes in the category of Pradani Bhuta Bhakti. But if a devotee is mainly focusing on Bhakti, and whatever other things he needs to do to maintain his life, he's thinking, oh, mm, I am doing. I have to do these things because it will be, uh, it will 
I will be collecting some money or collecting some food to offer boga to my deities or to uh, give to pure Vaishnavas. And I will do this within the context of the Vanashram system just to set an example for others. But it's not really a part of my sadhana. My sadhana is only Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Pada, Sevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasam, Sakyam, Atmanivedanam. All the angers of bhakti. This is my process. Then that person, he's also considered to be in the category of Ananya Bhakti. So I hope that that's uh, clear. Now, we're coming to uh, this verse. Manmana bhava mad bhakto majaji mam namaskaru. Krishna is, is describing in this chapter, chapter 9, he's instructing Arjuna how to be a parinishtita sadak. That is, his main focus is on bhajan, but he will do some duties not, for, not to purify himself, not as a part of his sadhak, but only to set an example for others. Mm. And the same verse we mentioned is spoken with some slight variation in the end, chapter 18, but the context here, Krishna is speaking about the near apeksha sadhak. So that's the speciality between these two verses. Now, In the 18th chapter, when Krishna said, Mame Vaishyasi Satyam Te, we're comparing it with this verse. In this verse today, Mame Vaishyasi Yuktaivam, but in the 18th chapter, Mame Vaishyasi Satyam Te. Uh, Krishna is saying, I am making a promise that you will uh, come to me. Now, just before speaking that verse, in the 18th chapter, in the previous verse, Krishna says, Sarva guyatamam bhuya surnume paramam vacha istosi me didam iti tatovakshami te hitam. Which means, now again, hear from me the paramam vacha, my highest instruction, which is sarva guyatamam, the most secret of all. So here you can see this. Uh, verse that is 1864 is a reference to this verse we're discussing today 934 because Krishna is saying Sarva Guya Tamam I am telling you the topmost secret and of course chapter 9 is called Raja Guya Yoga the king of secrets then he says Sarva Guya Tamam Buya Buya means again I'm telling you again by this Krishna is indicating I've already, the verse I'm about to speak, I've already spoken to you in chapter 9. Hmm? Understand? So Krishna is saying, Srinume Paramam Vachal, listen to my supreme instruction. Istosi me didamiti tato vakshami te hitam. I am telling you this, it's for your benefit, because you are very, very dear to me. So then Krishna is, says, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Madhyaji Mam Namaskaru Mami Vaisasi Satyam Te Pratijani Priyosime. Why did Krishna say Satyam Te? I am, when he repeated this verse for the second time, he's making a slight change. He's saying Satyam Te, I am making a vow. According to Shastra, the word Satyam can, means truth, it can mean Tatya which means fact. And the word satyam can also mean um, shapat. Shapat means I make a vow, just like Srila Raghunath Das Goswami. He says, Raghunath Das Goswami has prayed, O Shimati Radhika, I will never ask you for anything other than uh, to re render service to your lotus feet. Sakyayate mamo namosto namosto nityam. I bow down again and again to your sakis, to your friends, to your equals, but I don't want to be like them. Dasyayate mamo rasostu rasostu satyam. Here satyam means it is my vow that I simply want to 
experience the rasa of dasya, rather dasyam, being your maidservant. So, the word satya means shapat, to take a vow to, I swear that this is my determination. So, Krishna is saying uh, in, the, in the other version of this verse, satyam te, mm-hmm. is saying satyam te, indicating that I'm making a, a vow, Arjuna, surely you will come to me. And then he said, Pratijani Priyosime, I promise you this because you are very dear to me. So the reason Krishna says this is because Arjun may say to Krishna, but Krishna, you left Brindavan and you promised. Ayasyaiti Dautukai, oh, just after a few days I will return. But you didn't come back. So if you'll make a vow and say, you will come to me for sure, then how can I believe it? Because uh, you have uh, broken the, your vow before. Or Arjun may be saying, Hey Krishna, it is well known that the people of Mathura, they do shapat, satyam. They make a vow at every step, <laughs> but they cannot keep their vows. And because you are known as Maturesh, the prince of Mathura, then how can I believe your words when you say uh, that if I am your devotee, I bow down to you, I worship you, that I will come to you? How can I believe this? So see, Krishna said, Pratijane Priyosime, mm-hmm. I promise you because you are very dear to me. Mm-hmm. And the, the implication is that it might be that the residents of Mathura make so many vows uh, and uh, they cannot keep them. But if they make a promise to someone who is Priya, very, very dear to them, then out of love they will never break that vow. And this is why uh, when Krishna speaks this verse, Manmana Bhava Madhbhakto, again at the end of the Gita, Krishna ch- slightly changes the verse. Nami Vaisasi Satyam Te, I'm making a vow. And I won't break my vow because, uh, it, because Pratijani Priyosime, you are very dear to me. And even a resident of Mathura, if they make a vow, they cannot break it if they've made that vow to one who is very beloved. So uh, this is also one of the reasons why see, Krishna is repeating this verse two times with a little change. Uh, just to bring out his expression of love for Arjuna and that he will stand by his words and that he's, we should believe his guarantee. And uh, this is the highest and most confidential teaching. Now, Krishna is saying, Man mana, absorb your mind in me. That means, me, Krishna, with a human-like form, not with four arms, with two arms, with one beautiful smiling face, not with the thousand heads like the Mahapurush, like the universal form. Don't worship me like a, the size of a thumb, Paramatma, in the heart, like the yogis, because he's saying, Baba Madhbhakto, become my devotee. Don't be a jnani, don't be a yogi, don't be a karmi, madhbhakto, be my devotee. Mm -hmm. So, manmana bhava madhbhakto. Manmana means you should meditate on me exclusively. Don't think of anything else. How will you do that? Bhava Mad Bhakto, by becoming my devotee, that means engaging exclusively in hearing, chanting and remembering. Madhyajima, worship me. That means you should collect some flowers and ornaments and cloth and you should cook beautiful preparations and you should offer them to my deity form. Namaskuru, you should offer prayers to me and bow down. So, there are many 
yeah. examples in of this in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. For example, uh, Ambarish Maharaj, Savaimana Krishna Padara Vindayo Chamsi Vaikunta Gunanavanane. He engaged his mind in always thinking of Krishna, his words in always describing Krishna, his hands in cleaning the temple, his uh, feet in visiting the holy places, his head in bowing down to the Lord, his nose in smelling the flowers offered to the Lord, his desires in fulfilling the desires of the Lord and so on. So it being, as Krishna is saying in this verse, Yuktvayvam Atmanam Matparayana being dedicated to me with body, mind and words, completely united with me in devotional service, Mam Evaisasi, you will come to me. Hmm? Now, here in Krishna's instructions, there is also a, a question of degree. In other words, Krishna is speaking about the most advanced stage. And then, if you cannot do that, if you cannot do man mana bhava, if you cannot absorb your mind fully in me, then bhava mad bhakto, practice raganuga bhakti, by which you become like my man mana, absorbed in me like my eternal associates. Ma, and then if you cannot do raganuga bhakti, then madhyaji, do archan, follow the rules and regulations of deity worship. And if you cannot do that, at least uh, with as much devotion as you have, bow down to me and offer prayers to me and surely you will come to me. So in Shastra, there are so many examples of each stage. So we want to look at some histories of persons who personified each of the stages of Ananya Bhakti that Sri Krishna is expressing here. So first of all, manmana bhava. Krishna is saying, become manmana. Give your heart fully to me. So this level of devotion, see Krishna has described in regard to Braj Gopis. In the 10th canto, chapter 46, verse 4, there, see Krishna is in Mathura. And he is instructing Uddhav to take a message, his loving messages, to Braj, to, to pacify his parents, Nanda and Yashoda, and give his messages to the Braj Gopis uh, to relieve their separation. So, when Krishna gave this instruction to Uddhav, he began to describe the urgency with which Uddhav must go to Braj because of the intense separation of Braja Gopis. And there Sri Krishna is saying, Tha man manaska mat prana mad arte chakta daika mameva daitam prastam atmanam manasagataha. Here, Tha man manaska, their hearts are fully absorbed in me. That means that day and night they don't remember anything. Madatei chakta daihika. They've forgotten everything related to their body. They've forgotten to their uh, family members. They've forgotten even eating and sleeping. They've forgotten about the dressing and bathing and decorating themselves. But rather, they're at uh, the uh, Kadamba Kandi just outside Nandagaon, they're wandering in the forest day and night, sometimes fainting and rolling on the ground, crying, Oh Krishna, where are you? When will you come back to Vrindavan? And in this state, Krishna later told Uddhav, just before Krishna was about to leave this world, he said, those gopis of Braja, their minds were so absorbed in me, they are like yogis who have gone into samadhi. 
or they are like rivers that have entered into the ocean. When a yogi goes into samadhi, then he cannot remember where his body is. He cannot even remember his own name. When a river, which had a particular name, was flowing and then enters into the ocean, then it gives up its form or its name as, as that river. So in the same way, the Braj Gopi's minds are so absorbed in me that they forget everything about the past and the, and the present and the future. And they even forget their own body. They forget their own names. So, Sri Krishna said to Uddhav, that Dari and Tati Krishna, Praya Pranan Katanchana, Pratyagamana Sandecha, Balavo Me Madatmikaha. That in my absence, those gopis, Dari and Tati Krishna, they with great difficulty, Praya Pranan Katanchana, somehow or other, they're holding on to their pran. In other words, they feel such pain of separation that they could die and their pran could leave them. It would be easier for their pran to leave. But they're holding on to their pran. Why? Because they think, if Krishna has said, I will return. So if today or tomorrow or next month or after some years, Krishna comes to, back to Braja and he finds that we have passed away, he'll be sad. So I must not die. And they're struggling to hold on to their pran. Only for Sri Krishna's happiness, not even for themselves. Hmm? So, Balavo me Madatmika, Krishna said, Oh, they are Madatmika, they are my Atma, they are my soul. I am maintaining them in all ways. If an ordinary sadhak in this world who is doing Bhajan, Krishna said, Yoga, Kshema, Baham, Yaham, I maintain him. Then what to speak of the gopis of Vrindavan, who are really manmana bhava, totally absorbed in Krishna? How do they stay alive if they're not eating or drinking or sleeping? And Krishna is saying, saying, he's saying, Madatmika, I am, they are my soul. So you can never be separated from your soul. That means Krishna is always staying with them. So that also answers the question of Arjun, because Arjun is thinking, you have promised that uh, your devotee will come to you if they're absorbed in you. But you left uh, Brandavan and you promised to come back, but you didn't come back. So by saying, Balava me Madatmika, Krishna was indicating to Uddhav that actually, hey Uddhav, the gopis are my Atma. You are looking at me here in Mathura, but this is not fully me. This is only my shadow. If you want to see me fully as I am, go there to Vrindavan because I am always staying with the Braja Gopis. So, this is an example of Manmana Bhava of Braja Gopis in the stage of mature praying and in the stage of separation. Now, here an example of Manmana of a Gopi who is in the stage of Purvarag. That means, oh, just in the beginning stage of falling in love with Sri Krishna. So once there was a, a gopi. She was from outside of uh, Nandagaon. She was not from Krishna's village. But her marriage was arranged to a gopi there. So uh, when she was married, she came to live in Nandagaon with her husband's family. And uh, she had never seen Krishna. Only she had heard people speaking and saying the name Sham, Sham Sundar, Govinda, Damodar, Krishna Chandra. And uh, hearing this, she became very attractive, even though she'd never seen him, because Krishna is none different from his name. What to speak of that? Even the dust of Braja is so powerful that when a gopi from outside Braja just steps off the bullock cart and arrives and her feet touch the dust of Braja, then at once they become overwhelmed with brain. So she was in a state of uh, Puvarag. I want to see, though she'd never seen Krishna, she was thinking, where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? So one day in the evening time, the time of Goduli, 
The air became full of goduli, that is the dust raised by the hooves of the cows. The residents of Nandagaon could hear the sound of the humba humba, the cows mooing and their bells ringing and the boys playing flutes and blowing on buffalo horn bugles. And all the gopis, the elderly gopis and their daughters also, they were running from their houses. Some of them were going and standing at their gates. Some of them were going to the roofs of their houses or to their balconies to get a glimpse of Sri Krishna as he enters into the village. So at that time, the mother-in-law uh, of this new, newly arrived bride in Braja, she was leaving. And uh, then that new bride, she also wanted to go, but her mother-in-law told her, no, you cannot come, you have to stay here in the house. Then she said, but uh, look, even your own daughter is going, so why can't I go? And then she said, never mind what she's doing. You have to stay here. Don't go out because there's a great danger. You may be bitten by a black snake. <laughs> so then they kept her in the house and the, the, her mother-in-law and sister-in-law, they went out to see Krishna. But being overwhelmed with Bhavaraga, eagerness, a separation from Krishna, even prior to uh, seeing him or meeting with him. So she could not contain herself. So she snuck out of the house and out of the courtyard and she was went in a bush which was just on the um, main road the, that is called the um, the the, the um, Raja the, 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 the royal road into the village. So she was waiting there and she saw all the boys coming and there was a big crowd of boys and among them there in the dust she could not see very clearly but Krishna was there and she was looking with great eagerness at that time Krishna could understand her heart so he took the tail of a calf and he pointed the calf in the direction of that girl and then he twisted the tail and the calf went jumping in that direction so then see Krishna on the pretext of retrieving his calf he walked right up to uh, the bushes where that uh, new bride was waiting. And when he came there, then Sri Krishna, he stood right in front of her in his very beautiful Tribanga Mulrida form, bent in three places, at the feet, at the waist, and at the neck, like this. Mm -hmm. And he looked directly at that Brajagopi. When she saw his astonishing beauty, she became like a statue. She could not move. And see Krishna reached out with his flute. And she was shy. Her head came down. And see Krishna touched her on the chin with his flute. And lifted up her face. And then he took his calf and quickly uh, continued along the road. Now her heart had been completely stolen by see Krishna's mm, uh, indescribable and unparalleled beauty and she was just standing like a statue in samadhi in trance she didn't go anywhere then all the other villagers returned to their homes but the mother-in-law came back and said where is my daughter-in-law she could not find her anywhere she was searching searching and finally she came out and found her standing there by the main road and she spoke to her but there was no reply then she realized, she said, ah, now I understand. You, I warned you, but now you've been bitten by that black snake because you did not listen to me. And then she took her daughter-in-law by the hand and brought her back to the house. Then the mother-in-law said, oh, you should churn some yogurt and make butter. So then that daughter-in-law, because she was seeing the beauty of Krishna at every moment, Krishna's form would not go away from her chitta. So she was not concentrating and she took a pot, but it was not a pot of yogurt. It was a pot of mustard seeds and she put it down and put the churning rod inside and she was sometimes, grr, grr, sometimes churning and sometimes going in trance again and doing nothing. And then when she started to churn again, grr, grr, then all the mustard seeds were going over the kitchen. Then a mother-in-law came 
and thought, oh, she's become useless. And she said, stop doing that. You should go and bring some water from the Jamuna, from a well in the village. Not from Jamuna, from a well. So the mother-in-law, to try to bring her back into sense, gave her some responsibility. She'll have to pay attention now. So she put one pot on her head. And you've probably seen this if you've been to Braja. She put another pot on top of that pot and another pot on top of that pot. So she had three pots stacked up on her head. And also to make sure she was paying attention, she gave her um, a baby. Also, look after this baby. So then she got up and still absorbed in Krishna, carrying the baby in one hand and pots on her head and a rope for lowering the pots into the well. In her other hand, she slowly made her way to the village well. So there were other young girls there at the well. And uh, they saw that when it was her turn to draw water, she put down the baby and she put down the pot and then she took the rope and instead of putting the rope around the neck of the pot, she put the rope around <laughs> the baby. Hmm? And she was just about to drop the baby in the well hmm? due to inattentiveness. When the other gopis there said, stop, hi, hi, what are you doing? Alas. And one gopi said, oh, what's wrong with her? She looks like she's haunted by a boot, by a ghost. Then some other gopis who uh, were more experienced and understood because they had also fallen in love with Krishna. They said, no, no, not boot, but Nanda Poot. Poot means the son of Nanda Maharaj. So there's a very beautiful Brajabas poem. Mm. Purei kau kaise Pan ki adara Barachi si lagi Latame Fasake Nikase kau kaise Arei buto jo Hoi to jare jare Arei buto jo Hoi to jare jare Nand puta lagyo to the meaning is Jab se nirakko je shama piya Dare jia dheera Dare kao kaise Ever since See Krishna He looked at me Now I have lost all my patience I can barely stay alive Please tell me, please help me. How can I hold on to my pran even? Hmm? If a person is uh, injured by an arrow, hmm, then they can be cured and the injury can heal. But if a person has been shot by the arrow of the glance of Krishna or one has been injured by seeing the sweetness of his beautiful smile, then how will that wound in the heart ever be healed? Hmm? And the way he stands in a crooked way. It's like a spear. You know, if someone has a spear and the spear has a crooked shape, then when it goes in, then it's very hard to pull out. So in the same way, this crooked form of Krishna has gone into my heart and I cannot remove it. And if someone will try to catch you in a net, they throw the net over you, then it's possible that you can crawl out. But let the main say, uh, how can one who has whose heart has fallen into the net of Krishna's curling hair, Krishna's beautiful curling hair that falls in locks over his face, 
And if your heart has fallen into the net, then then how will your heart ever get out from this net? And if someone becomes haunted by a ghost, then they can call an exorcist and they can do an exorcism and they can um, expel that ghost. But if someone has become possessed by the son of Nanda Maharaj, then no exorcist can help you. How will that person be saved? Please tell me. So this is the example of Manmana Bhava. Krishna is saying, give your heart and your mind completely to me. Like Braja Gopis. So one may say, oh, this is Ragatmik Bhakti. Such devotion is only in the eternal associates. Hmm? Or those who have attained the Vastu Siddhi. And a position among those eternal associates in the spiritual world. But I am a sadhak here. Then what can I do? So Krishna said, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto. Then become my devotee. In Ragamark. How? Like Sri Bilva Mangal Thakur. Perhaps you know that Sri Bilva Mangal Thakur, he was mm, from uh, South India. He was born on the banks of the Krishna Baini River into a very high class Brahmin family and he was a great scholar of the Vedas and of Vedanta. Yet still, he had developed an attachment to a courtesan. Hmm? Some say prostitute, but not like you see today. Hmm? She was a courtesan. She was uh, very expert in, in poetry, music, singing, dancing, playing musical instruments. She was a very educated person, uh, but she made her money by entertaining men. So Bilva Mangal Thakur, he was very attached to visiting her. And uh, one day, it was actually the Sraddha uh, ceremony. He had to offer oblations for his forefathers, but neglecting his uh, family duties, everything, he set off to meet Chintamani who lived on the other side of the Krishna Beni River. So suddenly there was a huge storm and the sky became black. There was heavy rain. There, no one was trying to cross the river. There were no boats there. But he was so desperate to enjoy the company of Chintamani, the courtesan, that in the darkness and the heavy rain, he jumped into the flooding river and he was uh, uh, drowning. But he found something to hold on to, to keep him afloat. And kicking his legs, he made his way across the river. And then he got out and continued on his way. He was so desperate that he, he did not even know that that which thing he was holding on to in the dark to keep him afloat across the river was a dead body. He was so focused on his goal. Then when he came to the house of Chintamani, there was a big wall around her courtyard and the gate was locked. So he thought, let me climb over the wall. So he was looking for a way and he saw a rope hanging down from a tree close to the wall. So he grabbed the rope and he began to climb up and he got onto the wall. And then when he got onto the top, he slipped and he fell down the other side and crashed onto the ground in the courtyard of Chintamani. And he was knocked unconscious. So Chintamani was in her house and she heard, boom, this sound, a crashing sound in the courtyard. She thought, what is that? And she came outside and there she saw Bilva Mangal Thakur unconscious on the ground. She saw the snake hanging from the tree and realized, oh, he must have climbed up the snake to, to get over the fence. She was amazed. So she called her maidservants and they brought him into the house. And when he came into consciousness, she was actually repenting. And she was criticizing herself. She was thinking, this mm, Bilva Mangal, he is from a very high class family and a very learned person. And look how 
I am tempting him and misleading him from the good path of uh, spiritual life. I am so wretched, I am so abominable. From today, I will not do any more activities of, as a courtesan. I will simply dedicate my life to Sri Krishna. Mm -hmm. When Bilva Mangu Thakur heard her words, he was deeply moved and very embarrassed. And she said to him, oh, if you could be as attached to Krishna, as you are attached to my uh, material body, which is just the blood and flesh and fats and the just abominable material substances, if you could be as attached to Krishna as you are attached to my body, then your whole life would be successful. And when Bilva Mangal Thakur heard these words, then his life changed. And uh, he le from that moment, he left everything. And he set off to Brindavan. When he was on his way to Brindavan, there he came to a well and he saw a very beautiful woman. And he was so attracted to her that he followed her to her home. And when he came to her home, her husband was there and he saw, oh, a sadhu has come and he invited him, please come sit down. And then the Bilva Mangal Thakur, he said, please, can you bring your wife here? So then that man called his wife. Now Bilva Mangal Thakur was so ashamed that again he'd become attached to uh, wanting to enjoy the beauty of a woman. He said to her, oh mother, can you give me your hair pins? So then she took out two pins from her hair and then Bilva Mangal Thakur took them and he pierced both of his eyes. He said, where there is no cause, there will be no effect. I have become attached to this world through seeing the worldly beauty with my eyes. So now there is no cause, there will be no effect. And with the blood streaming down his face, he got up and he continued on his way. He wanted to go. He was coming from South India and he wanted to go very far, thousands of kilometers to Vrindavan. So now he was trying to make his way, but it was very difficult. Now he was blind, but his heart was pure. And he began to compose beautiful verses glorifying Krishna. Hey Deva, hey Daita, hey Bhuvanaika Bandhu. Hey Krishna, hey Chapala, hey Karanaika Sindhu. And these words, loving prayers of Bhuva Mangu Thakur, were very, very attractive. They were Krishna Kahanamrita. The book is called Krishna Kahanamrita, Nectar for the Ears of Krishna. So one day as Bhuva Mangal Thako was walking, then a boy came to him and said, Hey Baba, where are you going? Bhuva Mangal Thako said, I am going to Vrindavan. The boy said, I am also going to Vrindavan. Here, you hold my stick and I'll lead you there. So then Bhuva Mangal Thako held on to the stick of the boy and he was walking and the boy was leading him and as the boy was leading him, Bilba Mangal Thakur was reciting his poetry. Then when they arrived in Vrindavan, then Sri Krishna, he mm, ran away. Bilba Mangal Thakur, he called out, oh, Krishna, Krishna. He'd realized now that it was Krishna himself who had come to lead him to Vrindavan. Where are you? And then he challenged Krishna. He said, uh, I challenge you. You can run away from my hand, but you cannot run away from my heart. So in this way, the life of Bhuva Mangal Thakur became successful. So here see Krishna is saying, Man Manab Baba Mad Bhakto. The gopis, see Krishna's eternal associates, they are the example of Man Manab Baba. And Bhuva Mangal Thakur is an example of Bhava Mad Bhakto, a devotee. Now we're coming to Madhyajima. So, my Gurudev, he used to uh, give an example uh, of a, one Baba, one old sadhu who lived in Mathura. Srila Gurudev was staying for many years in Keshavji Gaudiya Mart. And there in Mathura, there was one all the Baba and he used to every day do Archan 
of Shalagram Shila. And he had great nishta in Archan. Even though he was not very learned in all the many rules and regulations and different rituals. But still, he had great nishta in the services that he was doing. So once he took a vow, it was uh, during the month of Mag, that is like uh, from middle of uh, January to the middle of February. So it's a very cold season in, in uh, northern India, in Mathura. And he made a vow that he would only uh, do the snan, the bathing of his Shalagram Shila every morning with water from the Jamuna after taking bath in Jamuna. So he lived at some distance from the Jamuna and every morning uh, before dawn in the Brahma Mohorta, he would set out from his house and walk through the streets of Mathura and come to the Ghat there, take bath in the freezing cold water and then fill his lota with Jamuna water and then go back and then do the snan for his uh, Takurji, his Shalagram Shila. So, one night, it was the Amavasya. That means the dark moon night. There's, there was no moon and there was a very big storm, dark clouds and heavy rain. And uh, the, you could not see any stars or anything. And though it was the middle of the night, that old Baba, he woke up and he was thinking, oh, it's Brahma Mohorta. Even though it was much earlier than that. So he set off to go to Jamuna and he was walking through the streets. Somehow rather he made his way there, but there was no one around because uh, many people are bathing in the early morning, but it was so early. No one was there at all. And then he got into the freezing cold water of Jamuna and he came out and then he filled his uh, pot for uh, the for the Krishna snan with Jamuna water, but by now a, a very very cold icy wind was blowing, and uh, he took shelter in the doorway of a house, and uh, everywhere was becoming flooded, and he was trembling, shivering. He thought that he may not even survive, but he wasn't concerned for himself. He was just thinking, oh. How will I get home in time to complete my morning puja and bathe my Shalagram Shila of Krishna uh, with this Jamuna water? This is what he was worried about. After a little time, he saw in the dark someone was coming with a lantern. And the, uh, the, this uh, young boy with a lantern asked him, Oh Baba, I have a blanket, come with me. And he put the blanket over the, the Baba and with his lantern, then he said, Oh, where do you live? He said, Oh, this part of town. The boy said, I'll help you. And covering him with a warm blanket and holding the lantern in front, he led him through the town. And even though it was quite far distance, he found after walking just a short way, he had arrived at his home safely. And he was so relieved. He was like, Oh, today I thought I may die. And I might not be able to do my uh, service of bathing Krishna. And, and he felt very grateful for that boy. And he was wondering, oh, I should ask him, what's his name? So he turned to ask him, who are you? But the, he was not seen anywhere. He could not see anyone there at all. So then that old man, he froze and became stunned. Hi, hi, alas, alas. Oh, Chalia. Chalia means cheetah. Oh, you cheetah. You came here to protect my vow. But now you have cheated me and you have gone away. And he was weeping. So, here, Krishna is saying, Madhyajimam. If you cannot be in the highest frame, like gopis of Vrindavan, then follow Raghunuga Bhakti like Bilva Mangal Thakur. And if you cannot be so advanced like Bilva Mangal Thakur, then at least have Nishta in following the rules and regulations of Archan and serve your deity and practice Bhakti 
according to rules and regulations with great nishta. Madhyaji, hmm? ma'am. So Krishna is saying, Vaisyasi, if you do this, you will come to me. Hmm? But that can also mean I will come to you. Because in each case you can see here, when gopis are in Vrindavan, feeling separation from Krishna, but they have sporty and they see that Krishna is there with them and they dance with him in Rasalila. Bhuva Mangal Thakur, Krishna came to him and led him to Vrindavan. And this old Baba of Mathura, also Krishna came to him. So Krishna said, Janma karma chame divyame ivamyo veti tatvataha chaktva deham puna jama neti mame ti sorjuna. For those who know in truth the transcendental nature of my birth and activities, when he gives up this body, he does not take birth again in this world, but he comes to me. But another meaning of this verse is one who realizes my transcendental nature, then not when he gives up his body. In other words, before he gives up his body, he comes to me. That means that Krishna comes personally and reveals himself to his devotee in this very lifetime. So, Mami Vaisyasi Yuktaivam Atmanam Matparayana. If you are dedicated to me with body, mind, and words, and with your pran, with your intelligence, with your determination, everything, then, Mami Vaisyasi, you will come to me. So now Krishna is also saying Namaskuru, Namaskar, according to uh, Bhakti Sandarbha. There, um, Srila Jiva Goswami in uh, Bhakti Sandarbha, he says that uh, Namaskar, Bandana, Bandanam means Namaskaram, Bandanam, Namaskaram. So, it means uh, offering prayers and uh, bowing down. It is said that uh, Akrura became perfect just by Bandana. That means by Namaskar. So, uh, Namaskaru, Krishna said, just bow down to me. The glories of bowing down to Krishna have been described in Srimad Bhagavatam to, by Yamaraj to the Yamadutas. When the Yamadutas told Yamaraj that when they tried to take away Ajamil, then Vishnu Dutas came and saved him. Then Yamaraj said to them, O Yamadutas, bring to me only those sinful persons whose tongues do not chant the name of Krishna, whose minds do not remember the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, and only bring to me those persons who in their life have not even once bowed down their heads to see Krishna. So, this is the showing that if a person will just do Namaskaru, bow down to Krishna only once in their life, then they will never be taken to Yamaraj. It is so powerful. Also, it is said in, in the Puranas, Dashashvamedi puna eti janma Krishna pranami na puna bhavaya. If a person does ten Ashvameda Jagyas, that is a, a huge sacrifice, which is extremely expensive, extremely technical, and uh, takes a very long time to perform and requires a great amount of wealth. Hmm? But if a person does ten Ashvameda Jagyas, still he will take birth again in this world. But Krishna pranami na puna bhavaya. But one per a person who has bowed down only once to see Krishna will never take birth again in this material world. Also, in the Skanda Purana, it is said that even if a person bows down to Krishna deceitfully, mm -hmm. like once there was a, a prostitute, who used to go every morning to a temple and one man was attracted to her. So he was thinking to try to attract her attention. I also go to the same temple every morning. So he started going to the temple and he would come in and bow down. But his bowing was completely deceitful. But it is said in the Skanda Purana, even if one deceitfully bows down to, secret, to Vishnu, then all his sins accumulated from 
the 100 lifetimes are immediately destroyed. So, in this way, the power of Namaskar has been given. And Krishna is essentially by this verse speaking about the glories of Ananya Bhakti. This is the conclusion of this verse and the content, the essence of this entire chapter. The greatest secret is not to put your faith in karma or nishkarm karma or even Bhagavad Arpita nishkarm karma, Pradani Bhuta Bhakti, but rather put your faith fully in Ananya Bhakti. One pointed devotion. If you are near a Peksha, you have renounced everything, then you can do all the time. One pointed devotion. And if you you are not uh, you have not renounced everything you are a householder and you have to do some dutiful things, but don't put your faith in the performance of duty as a purifying process, but rather just do it to set like an actor, just setting an example for other persons while internally keeping your heart always dedicated to Sri Krishna, and then it, it, that parinistita sadak also is in the uh, category of. Ananya Bhakti. And this Ananya Bhakti is performed Man Mana Baba in the highest sense of having the heart absorbed in Krishna. If you cannot do that, Bhava Mad Bhakto, follow Raganuga Bhakti if you have the greed, the samskars, impressions from association with Rasik Vaishnavas. And if that greed has not come, then Madhyaji Mam, just serve me in, uh, in the deity form and practice the hearing, chanting, and remembering. In according to the rules and regulations of devotion. If you cannot do that, at least every day, Namaskaru, bow down to me. Krishna says, Mami Atmanam Parayana. If you do this, you will come to me. Why? Because those who will bow down, gradually they uh, develop the devotional uh, impressions to take up strictly the practice of Vaidhi Bhakti. And those who practice Vaidhi Bhakti strictly, if they have the association of Rasik Vaishnavas, they will quickly enter into Raganuga Bhakti. And those who will follow Raganuga Bhakti, then uh, when uh, at the end of this life, they will enter into the eternal pastimes of Radha and Krishna, and then they will fulfill Krishna's request, Man Mana Baba, to be, have their heart always totally absorbed in thinking of the happiness of Sri Krishna. Like the hearts of Braj Gopis, they have become a Kama Denu. Kama Denu means a wish fulfilling cow. When a person approaches a Kama Denu, they, they ask, Oh, please give me this. And the Kama Denu never thinks of herself, she's just giving whatever is in the heart, the request of that person. So the buddhi, the manas, the mind and intelligence of Braj Gopis has become a Kama Denu, which never conceals anything. Only what is the desire of Krishna and how to fulfill that. That is Manmana Bhava. That Gopi's Prem, the Prem of Gopis of Vrindavan is the highest goal of life. And among the Gopis Prem, uh, we especially want to follow Rupamanjari and the maidservants of Radhika who know that the best way to please Krishna is to Offer to see Krishna, Shimati Radharani. She is the mm, greatest uh, paraphernalia of Sri Krishna by which Krishna can be pleased. And therefore, service to Radhika is the greatest way to please Krishna. And there, mm, Manmana Bhava means your heart should be absorbed in Radhika. And by that absorption in serving Radhika, this will please me the most. This is the highest instruction among all the uh, nuances of Ananya Bhakti. Baliye Vrindavan Bihari Lala Ki Jai, Varasani Wali Ki Jai, Jai Jai Sri Radhe Sham, Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo.